Um. All right. Welcome, friends. I'm so glad you're here. Um, I thought we might begin with this prayer that comes from the Book of Common Prayer for the church. Gracious God, we pray for thy holy Catholic Church. Fill it with all truth, in all truth, with all peace. Where it is corrupt, purify it. Where it is in error, direct it. Where in anything it is amiss, reform it. Where it is right, strengthen it. Where it is in want, provide for it. Where it is divided, reunite it. For the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. 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 So this is the uh, third installment of um, the sort of orientation to the Episcopal Church that we began pre-COVID, back when we could actually be in the same place and talk to each other and sit next to each other. Seems like, you know, ages ago. Uh, uh, and just as a reminder, we started, the, the first session was Father Peter doing a, a presentation on scripture, kind of an overview of scripture and the, the place of scripture in the Episcopal Church in particular. And then the, the, the second and the last time we actually were all together in one place, I did a kind of uh, speed dating approach to uh, church history trying to cram in 2,000 years of the development of the church into about 50 minutes. Uh, so we left out a few things, but some of, the, some of the highlights were covered about the beginnings of the church, some of the basic questions that the church had to address, uh, then the Reformation and the beginnings of uh, the Anglican church, the separation of the English church from the Church of Rome, and then a little bit about the beginning of the uh, Episcopal Church as, as we know it, that arose as a result of the uh, American Revolution. And then for the last four sessions, Father Peter's been talking about the thing that makes the Episcopal Church and the Anglican Church most distinctive, which is the Book of Common Prayer. It's, it's the foundation, really, of our life as a, a denomination and as a congregation. So what I'm gonna do for the next three sessions is something like um, a sociological look at the church as it is right now. It's like when, when we talk about the Episcopal Church, what is it that we're talking about? We experience the Episcopal Church for the most part as a parish. We get together once a week, we maybe are involved in different committees, we see how the, the congregation engages with the community, uh, and we have some connection and sense of being a part of a diocese, and we see the bishop and the canon from time to time. Uh, some of us go to diocese convention and other sorts of diocesan events. But the, the larger church uh, that is called the Episcopal Church, we only pretty infrequently intersect with that and the, the larger Anglican communion that we're a part, we hardly ever connect to. So this is trying to flesh out some of those other associations that go into making what we call the Episcopal Church. So is that clear? You have a sense of where we're going? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you hear the Episcopal Church, um, what, what do you think of? What, what, what do you associate with the Episcopal Church? I think progressive. Progressive. I was thinking maybe freedom. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Well, to me, it's a, a, a very formal. Uh, the Eucharist is very formal compared to other churches. 
Uh huh. Yep. Uniform. Uniform. Yes, I mean it's like w when we travel, we're pretty. Yeah. Pretty okay. sure we're going to be in a familiar place. Yeah. That the service will be very much the same. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Anything else? All right. Well, we may come back to that. So those are all great. I mean, those those are our, our distinctive characteristics of the Episcopal Church, and we'll talk a little bit about why that is as we go along. Um, one thing to know is what the, the name of the Episcopal Church actually is. It's a mouthful. The Domestic and Foreign Missionary Society of the Protestant Episcopal Church in the United States of America. Really catchy, doesn't it? <laughs> Something you want to tell all your friends that you're, you're a member of that. So uh, the only place that this language appears is in the legal documents that incorporates the national church. You won't see it any place else, but it, it gives a certain sense of where it comes from. You know, a missionary society that looks both internationally and domestically Protestant, very much a sense of Protestant roots and US focused, although that isn't quite as true now as it once was, and you'll see what that means. So, the Episcopal Church is a complicated enterprise. There are 111 dioceses and regional areas in 17 countries. So the Episcopal Church that we think of as the Church of the United States actually has many other nations that are a part of us. Uh, and in this next map, I'll show you some of that international uh, dimension of the Episcopal Church. So you're going to find Episcopalians in surprising places like Haiti or uh, Ecuador or Taiwan. Or as Henny and I found, we went to the Episcopal Church in Paris. So uh, interesting things. And the other thing to know about the the church is that it's part of this larger, much larger international communion that we call the Anglican communion. Let's see here. So take a look at this map. What, what strikes you about this map? This, this is the map of the, the Episcopal church. So you see where we are, San Joaquin over there in the center of California. One of them, that the, the entire church is divided up into provinces, all right? So there are nine provinces. And the provinces are basically kind of administrative divisions that just make this very large enterprise a little bit more manageable and enable clusters of dioceses to be mutually supportive of one another. Okay. So province eight, we're a part of province eight. Uh, the bishops of, of province eight meet regularly together. The canons of province eight meet regularly together. The deacons of province eight meet every three years. Uh, so it's mostly about mutual support and sort of consultation. Um, it has a minimal sort of administrative footprint. It's, it's mostly sort of volunteer folks who help make run it. Uh, they do have some resources that each of the diocese kicks in a little bit of money to, to make the provinces work. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm the co-chair of the uh, Immigration Commission for this diocese, and we've received a couple of grants from Province 8 for some of the things that we've done, like the uh, Pilgrimage of Hope. We received a grant for that. 
Another thing to notice about province eight, of which we are part, is that in addition to the states along the West Coast and uh, Alaska and Hawaii, you'll also see Taiwan, right? So just our province is an international province, right? And then if you look at province nine, province nine is entirely international. The, the type there is small, I know. So, so Colombia, the Dominican Republic, two different dioceses in Ecuador, Honduras, Venezuela, and Puerto Rico, all part of province nine. Okay. Another interesting diocese in province eight to be aware of, you'll see it, between Utah and Arizona, there's just this circle, sort of a part of portion of a circle, which is Navajo land. And uh, it's an area mission because historically the Episcopal Church has been very active in the Navajo reservation. It's, a, it's its own diocese. And of course, it's an enormous area. Any question about that? Does the province have a capital or a place where there is an, an office or is it not like our diocese has its office? Yeah, I think that's, it's a floating reality. It, it basically has to do with, um, you know, who's responsible for what. So for example, uh, Alan Murray is this social justice and peacemaking staff person for province eight and he lives in in Portland, Oregon. But different people have different responsibilities. They're kind of scattered around. It's not, it's not like a diocese in that sense. It has multiple addresses. Okay. So a couple of other things that are interesting. If you look at province two, which takes in basically New York and New Jersey, also includes an international dimension. So the convocation of the Episcopal churches in Europe, there are several Episcopal churches across Europe, including the one that Henny and I attended in Paris. You'll see Haiti. Haiti is the largest diocese in the Episcopal church in terms of numbers huh. and the Virgin Islands. So why do you suppose some of these international dioceses are part of the Episcopal Church. How do you think that might have happened? Uh, probably, I know at one time on the East Coast, there's a, uh, some of those cotton farmers migrated down to uh, uh, some of those south, those islands in the South Atlantic there, I don't know what they're called, but, mm -hmm. but they could have taken the church with them when they went, to, they went down there and established new um, plantations. Yep, yep. No, that's right. That's right. So there's really sort of two mm, uh, movements that helped to make our church look this way. One was the missionary enterprise in the 19th and into the 20th century of you know people being sent out on behalf of their national church in this case the episcopal church to be missionaries uh, as it happens henny and i are acquainted with a guy named frank gray who uh, actually became the bishop of northern indiana but as a child his parents were missionaries in the philippines uh, and actually, he and his family were imprisoned in a, a Japanese prisoner war camp during the, the Second World War. But, you know, they were, you know, missionaries out there on behalf of the Episcopal Church in the United States. So some of these churches arose out of that missionary enterprise and have always maintained that connection. The other aspect has been sort of U.S. Uh, engagement with the world militarily. 
uh, or where we've had a, a significant commercial enterprises, Americans going overseas and then wanting to receive, you know, go to their church. And so providing those services became the seed really for uh, other churches uh, that became, maintained their connection even over time to the Episcopal Church. So here's the latest diocese to join the Episcopal Church. And this just happened recently, in the last few months, actually. Uh, anybody have an idea who these folks are, where they are? That's the presiding bishop way in the back there with that fancy hat on. Oh, yeah. Hmm. That's two. So if you look at the guy kneeling, kind of in the middle, he's got this uh, stole on, and on the stole. Oh, yep. <laughs> yeah. This is the Diocese of Cuba. Mm -hmm. So the Cuban Episcopal Church is, is part of our, our, our church as well. So, you know, we have uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, members of the Episcopal Church, same prayer book, although it would be in Spanish, you know, there in Cuba. You, you, could, you could go to that church, you'd know exactly where you were. So one of the things to think about in terms of participation in the Episcopal Church is that it has an international component to it, just by its very nature, all right? And that shapes some of its identity. It also shapes the way it understands mission, because particularly if something happens like a hurricane or an earthquake in Haiti, you will see the Episcopal Church gear up in a very particular kind of way to respond to those concerns because th these are members of our church that are suffering from those events. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So a little bit about the demographics of this Episcopal Church of which we're a part. Uh, as of 2018, there were just shy of two million Episcopalians, most of them living in the United States, and a few outside, as we've seen, about 160,000 living outside the United States. About 1% uh, of US adults identify as Episcopalian. So we're not a huge presence in the US, but we have an outsized impact because of our history, because of uh, the wealth, actually, of the church. Uh, and we've always been a significant presence in, in the life of this country. Compared to the general public, Episcopalians tend to be older. So, you know, I've chatted with some of you about the concern of the, the demographics of our church. We'd like to get in younger people, younger families, have more of a, a children's program. That struggle is, typical of Episcopal churches across the United States and actually typical of many mainline Protestant churches of which we're a part. Uh, about 90% of the Episcopal church are white. Uh, we have you know, a, a, an important African-American presence, Native American presence, Pacific Islanders, Asian, but it, it's we are historically and still predominantly a white church. And uh, another thing to know about the church is, and in some ways outside of the Episcopal Church, the thing we're probably most known for as is being open and affirming that we, we have gay bishops and priests and uh, we perform uh, uh, same-sex marriages and things like that. This, didn't start out to be the distinctive characteristic of the Episcopal Church. It was more just trying to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, but it's become one of those markers about who we are and who people outside our church identify us about. Okay, so those are some things about the Episcopal Church. We as the Episcopal Church are part of this much larger Anglican communion, a really global 
enterprise. Remember, you know, we talked about this when we did the church history, that, you know, our roots are in England. It took, when the Henry VIII took the Church of England out of the Roman Catholic Church and with the help of Cramner and others established the uh, Church of England, that's, that's our kind of root that then was severed during the American Revolution and our identity kind of reconfirmed and redefined really uh, as the Anglican tradition, but resident in the United States. But we've never severed that connection to this larger enterprise. So a little bit about that Anglican tradition. So, you know, we're, our roots go back in this Anglican church to uh, Henry's separation. The Anglican communion is made up of 40 independent churches, of which the U.S. Episcopal Church is one. There are over 85 million people who are part of the Anglican communion in over 165 countries. So it's a vast expanse. And like the, the history of the Episcopal Church in terms of its international identity, much of the international identity of the Anglican Church is rooted in the colonial enterprises of Great Britain, of, of England, you know, in Africa and in Asia. Uh, so it's not too surprising, you know, you go to Kenya, there's a, an Anglican church. In South Africa, there's an Anglican church. In Tanzania, there's an Anglican church. The thing that unites all those churches together, and it's the reason we spent so much time talking about it over the last four sessions, is the Book of Common Prayer. This is really the linchpin that around which all these millions of people and these various national churches revolve. We are people who use the Book of Common Prayer to pray together. It's a, it's a form of, as you said, Ken, a kind of formal liturgy. It does look a little bit different from country to country. Obviously, the language will change, but it's, it's at its heart. It's the way of being the church by the way we worship together. The Archbishop of Canterbury, this, you're looking at uh, the present Archbishop of Canterbury. His name is Justin Welby. He is the spiritual leader of the Anglican Communion, and he's also the head of the Church of England. He's the successor of Thomas Cramner, right? So he is a, a spiritual leader. He's not the Pope, so he can't order people to do anything. He only functions as a kind of convener, as a, as a mediator, sometimes as a, a conflict mediator, because things can get quite contentious within the Anglican Church or Anglican Communion. But uh, his role is is predominantly that of a facilitator and a coordinator. Any question about all of this so far? Okay. So we and the Episcopal Church are different from most other uh, communions or churches in the Anglican tradition. And it's because of the American Revolution. And we'll talk more about how we structure ourselves, the polity of the Episcopal Church tomorrow. But you know, the, the fact that many of the, the, the key thinkers and founders of the Episcopal Church were also the people helping to shape the, the, this new country meant that there was a particular emphasis on having a balance of powers. So, you know, if you've read much about general convention or maybe you've gone to general convention, there's, there's a house of bishops and there's a house of deputies. There's, there's a very significant role and authority that lay people and clergy other than bishops have in making the decisions about the life and policy of the Episcopal Church. That is not like most other 
uh, Anglican uh, communions. And it's certainly not what it's like, say, in the Church of England, where bishops have much greater authority. And it's part of the reason that the Episcopal Church can be so perplexing to other Anglican rooted uh, traditions, because we make decisions, and the way that we make those decisions is, is kind of inscrutable to people. I mean, those of us who you know, took any kind of government class, you read the way the church functions, and it's like, yeah, it's like Congress, okay. But for many other uh, traditions or parts of the Anglican Communion outside the United States, it, it can be puzzling, uh, to say the least. So there are four kind of key instruments or ways that the Anglican communion works. The first is the Archbishop of Canterbury. So he's the spiritual head. Secondly, there's something called the Lambeth Conference of Bishops. Lambeth is the London palace of the Archbishop of Canterbury. It goes back a long time. The Lambeth Conference happens about every 10 years. And uh, you may have read uh, Bishop David was going to be taking um, a sabbatical. And during his sabbatical, part of the reason he was doing that sabbatical was to participate in the Lambeth Conference that was going to be happening, I think, right about now. Uh, but of course, COVID-19 sank that plan as well as all of his uh, other uh, sabbatical plans. So the Lambeth Conference has been postponed till next year. But at that event, all the bishops of all the different Anglican uh, churches or Anglican dioceses around the country meet. It's over, you know, 100 or, uh, I forget how many, it's, it's a lot, it's a whole bunch of people. The third one is the primates meeting. This would be the, the meeting that just the, uh, Michael Curry, our, the presiding bishop, would attend. This meets usually annually, and it tries to address more immediate concerns among the churches. This is the place where there's been particular wrestling around some of the choices that the Episcopal Church has made about the ordination of gay bishops, and for example, single-sex marriage. And then the fourth and final one is called the Anglican Consultative Council. And this brings together bishops, lay people, and clergy. And it mostly focuses on mission. Okay. Oh, sounds like somebody's at the door. Sorry, I can't get it to stop. We were quitting a minute. All right. <laughs> okay. Moving on. So I wanted to talk just a little bit about the things that make this tradition, the Anglican tradition, whether it's the Episcopal Church of the United States or the Anglican Church in Kenya or the, the Church of England, all of those churches have these things in common and they make our religious tradition distinctive. One is this sort of, you know, a balance between Protestantism and Catholic uh, practice. So we are, are clearly a Protestant church. We are a product of the Reformation. We broke away from the Church of Rome. We identify ourselves as a Protestant church. But in that breaking away, we retained more than most the practice, religious style uh, of worship uh, of the Catholic church. So we are both Protestant and Catholic. And uh, in the period of the Elizabethan era, they talked about the via media, the middle way between the extremes of a, a kind of a severe reformed tradition and Roman Catholicism. Another thing that makes our tradition distinctive is worshiping in our first language. This was one of the main revolutions at the time that uh, Henry separated from the Church of England, and it was the genius of Thomas Cranmer to create the foundation for that, which was the Book of Common Prayer. Wherever you go, 
you know, the Anglican tradition worships in the language of whoever they're with, right? So if you're in uh, Latin America, it's like to be in Spanish. If you're in Cuba, it's certainly going to be in Spanish. Uh, but the idea was, whoever you are, you should be praying in your own language. Third thing, and something we've talked at great length about, is, is the Book of Common Prayer. It's really, you know, the, the, the linchpin around which all our, our spiritual and liturgical life revolves. I just want to point out the, the, the main thing there is that that last paragraph, we, we as, a, as the Episcopal Church and the more large Anglican communion, we are a community of practice. The emphasis is really on what we do together, praying together, rather than on subscribing to a particular set of beliefs, although we do have defined sets of beliefs. All right, so, but that's really important because it, it arises out of a recognition and a respect for individuals' conscience, to not impose something on the people. The last thing I want to talk about in terms of what, what makes us distinctive are these three items, scripture, tradition, and reason. Richard Hooker, who was probably still is the most famous Anglican theologian, he's our version of Thomas Aquinas, put together the laws of ecclesiastical polity. It's a, it's a big three volume set, trying to lay out what it meant to be an Anglican. And one of the things that he talked about is he described it as a three legged stool, scripture, tradition, and reason. We are Protestant, we are rooted in scripture. Scripture is essential to our life. Everything we do is founded on scripture, including our Book of Common Prayer. But scripture has to be read through a lens. And the lens that we use is tradition. The way that the church developed over those first 500 years, particularly, to see the, the growth and the development of how liturgical life developed. So our worship that we do on Sundays, especially that Eucharist, is very much based on the way the church developed its liturgical life in those first 500 years. It's why we have such an emphasis on reciting the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. And the third piece was reason. Scripture has to also be read through the eyes of reason. We're not a church, we're not a fundamentalist church, all right? So we don't see needing to leave our mind at home when we read scripture or when we worship together. Unlike some other traditions who see uh, rationality as, as a threat and particularly science as a threat, that, that's not true of the Episcopal Church. We respect the value that reason and science can bring to our understanding of, of what creation is all about and our place in it. Any question about those things? Okay. It makes the Episcopal Church distinctive, and this is also true of the Anglican Church, but I'm just, now I'm gonna just talk about the Episcopal Church is that we're very ecumenical. So we have, from the beginnings of the ecumenical movement in the early part of the 19th century, uh, been involved in those kinds of dialogues, both about unity of the church, but also about mission and how we, together with other Christians, can be a witness of Christ's compassion in the world. The Episcopal Church was one of the founders of the National Council of Churches and Church World Service, Church World Service is who I used to work for for a long time, and also the World Council of Churches. Okay, so at every level, the Episcopal Church is an active uh, participant and leader in helping to shape how the, the Jesus movement, as the presiding bishop would say it, might witness most effectively in our wounded world. Okay. So I wanted to lift up 
a couple of things where you can go for more information uh, about the Episcopal Church and the communion more broadly. One, I don't know, have any of you gone to the Episcopal Church's website, episcopalchurch.org? I'm going to take you there in, in a couple of minutes, but I would really recommend that you spend some time there because it's, it's a great resource. Anglicancommunion.org, as you might suspect, is the website for the Anglican Communion. The Anglicanalliance.org is the service entities of the various uh, Anglican churches around the world who are engaged in helping refugees or assisting people who are hungry. And then for the latest news on the Episcopal Church, Episcopal News Service is, is a great resource. And then I wanted to lift up four books that I thought you might be interested in. And if you'd like, I can email these titles to you so you don't need to copy them. But the, the two books at the top, uh, John Westerhoff's and Scott Gunn and Melody Wilson Shobes Walk in Love, are, they try to do sort of what Peter and I have been doing in this course, to give you a, an overview of what the Episcopal Church is all about, what the uh, Book of Common Prayer is about, how we work together, how we pray together, how we organize our life together, and they're great. The Episcopal Handbook is just what it says. It's, it's this great little uh, booklet that has all kinds of stuff on, you know, some of the more arcane things about the Episcopal Church is like, why does the logo of the Episcopal Church have those stripes and you know, what is that about? Uh, and, and helps you identify some of the names of things that sometimes can be pretty abstruse. And then Jeffrey Lee's book, the opening, the prayer book, is I think one of the best overviews of the Book of Common Prayer. It's very accessible. It's not that long. Uh, and if, if you wanted to know more from having those four sessions with Father Peter, this would be a, a great book to uh, consider uh, ordering. It's, it's really lovely, I think. Okay. So I wanted to um, do a bit of a tour of the Episcopal Church's website. Because this has got uh, really some great information in it. Um, So under what we believe, you can find more information about the Bible, more information about the Book of Common Prayer, the creeds. You know, if you wanted to, to sort of dive further down into those kinds of questions, you would find a lot of great information there. Under what we do is some description of some of the major things. Oh, sorry. I'm saying my screen is just a blank gray. Are you showing the website or? I am. And is, is it not showing on your screen? Not on mine. Not on mine. I'm, I'm seeing you. Oh, oh I, I, I see what I did. Okay, very good. My, my apologies. I thought it would transfer itself and it didn't. Okay. How's that? That's good. <laughs> I see a road. You see a road. Okay, very good. So this is the, the homepage for the Episcopal Church, episcopalchurch.org. And I, I was saying, sorry, I, thank you for pointing that out. Uh, this section, what we believe, gives you a, a glimpse of you know, some of the key things. It talks about how we understand the Bible, gives you links to portions of the Bible. Same with the Book of Common Prayer. This is, this is great for, you know, sort of those foundational beliefs. And then under what we do, that's where I was going next, uh, some really helpful information on 
part, what's the Jesus movement all about? More information about liturgy and music. But I particularly wanted to lift up these things under ministries. So you know, you know, the presiding bishop Michael Curry, and you see him on news programs and uh, sometimes in worship services and things like that. But in addition to being the public voice of the Episcopal Church in a variety of ways, he is also the chief executive of a, a bureaucracy of the Episcopal Church that's housed at 8.50. And as you might imagine, it takes a lot of um, human energy to make uh, an institution as large and as diverse as the Episcopal Church, enabling it to function. So what you see here are the ministries that are housed uh, in, in a kind of metaphorical sense, they're at 815 in New York. Each one of these has a person or persons that are responsible for uh, connecting with those who are involved in this ministry across the church, being uh, responsible for helping to plan continuing education events, to cultivate people who might be interested in pursuing those ministries. Uh, there's a, an enormous amount of work underneath each one of these okay so for example armed forces you know there are all kinds of episcopal chaplains uh, that are assigned to uh, military facilities uh, around the country and, and indeed internationally that's coordinated by that person uh, asian american ministries there are numerous uh, congregations uh, around the United States who have predominantly Asian American populations. Uh, and this ministry is in part to make sure that there are resources, worship resources, education resources for those communities, and also to train people in how to engage those ministries. Similarly with black ministries. We've heard a lot recently about creation care. This is a, one of the major foci of the Episcopal Church for this triennium that we're in. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be hearing more about creation care, both within uh, St. John's and also within our diocese, because uh, Deacon Terrence Goodpasture has been kind of tasked by the bishop to pull together a commission on creation care. But our effort is part of this larger national church-wide effort in creation. So I'm not gonna go through each one of these, but, but this gives you, I think, uh, a, a, the breadth of the ministry that the uh, Episcopal Church is engaged in. Uh, I work a lot with Episcopal Migration Ministries because of the work that I do on behalf of the diocese in migration issues. The Episcopal Migration Ministries program is one of 10 uh, uh, agencies that's uh, uh, recognized by the State Department that resettles refugees in the United States, although that refugee flow now has virtually stopped. But uh, it's a really important ministry of the, the larger church. And I'm just going to scroll down here. Latino ministries, I mean, you. You know about uh, Deacon Nelson, who has recently come here from Colombia. He's our Latino ministry for this diocese. And again, he sort of embodies this larger church-wide uh, effort in terms of engaging Spanish-speaking people in our communities. And then the last one that I'll talk a little bit about is the Office of Governmental Affairs. So the the Episcopal Church has, from its inception, seen itself as a public church. That is, that it's responsible for bringing the values of our Christian tradition into the public square. And the, where that's coordinated now is by the Office of Governmental Affairs, Governmental Relations, rather, in Washington, D.C. And they have a staff of several people 
who carry portfolios for different kinds of issues like immigration and migration, uh, poverty, uh, gun violence, things like that. Uh, and these folks are our voices on behalf of the national church and their, their work is framed by the policies and resolutions that are passed by a general convention. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk more about general convention tomorrow. Okay. When you say tomorrow, do you mean next week? Um, yeah, next time, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Isn't it tomorrow? You've said that twice now, but we're not meeting tomorrow. We're not meeting tomorrow. Okay. Thank I, you. You're welcome. Thank you, dear. That's what I <laughs> What would I do without you? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> You'd be meeting tomorrow all by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then last resource that I think you might find useful. One is this thing. So a glossary of terms. You know, the Episcopal Church, more than most, I think, uh, excels at sometimes kind of obscure words. I mean, when Henny and I first started going to the cathedral in Northern Indiana, they said the coffee hour would be in the undercroft. Right. And Henny and I looked at each other going, <laughs> where? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's lots of interesting terms. And if you en encounter uh, a term, you just don't know what in the world that is, this glossary uh, it can be a very helpful resource, and I would encourage you to, to use it. It's, it's great. Thank you for uh, that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, Episcopal asset map uh, in two weeks, not in two days. Uh, so we'll come back to that. OK. So are there any questions about the website? or what you saw there. It's a lot to study there. Yeah. There's a lot, yeah. It, it, yeah. It, it, there's a lot of great information there and it, 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 it's worth your time just to sort of wander around. I mean, you don't have to figure it out all at once. It's pretty user-friendly, but um, it's particularly because you've been involved in these classes, I think, you would find areas that's like, oh, well, I was wondering about that. I would like to learn more about that. Well, the, the website is a great place to go to, you know, just get a little bit more of a sense of, of what that's about. Uh, and of course, there's um, Episcopal News Service uh, also is a great place to go, particularly for, for, for you know, what's happening right now, uh, things that are happening uh, in the Episcopal Church or things that the Episcopal Church is engaged in, all right, in terms of, you know, Black Lives Matter or, you know, immigration issues or, or you know, there's been a disaster in Haiti. Episcopal News Service is going to be one of the best places to go to learn about how the Episcopal Church is responding to that, okay? You can get on their mailing list and then they'll send you emails periodically. That's right, that's right. And if you're a Facebook person, they have a Facebook presence. And, you know, if you like their Facebook page, then you'll, you'll receive information from them that way as well. Okay. Any other questions about anything that I've talked about? Does that all make sense? Yeah. I need to digest it. Yeah. yeah it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. So next time, not tomorrow, in a week, yeah. what I'm going to do is uh, a dive into how the church uh, does its decision making. Okay, this kind of, you know, bicameral uh, approach to making decisions. It makes us a, as a church very distinctive. Uh, and it's part of why we've become, you know, the, when and you talked about thinking of us as progressive or associating us with freedom. Part of the reason those come to mind is because of the way we do our decision making. 
because it's inclusive of the entire church. It's not just clergy, it's not just bishops, it's everybody that's represented in one way or another in the decision making of the church. And uh, it makes us distinctive, and I think it makes us prophetic in, in this country for sure. All right. Well, friends. There are other denominations that I do got. that, I think, I, like the Presbyterian. Oh, <laughs> oh good, good. I didn't hear you what you said, Annie. I was just saying that there are a few other denominations, oh, yeah, yeah. Like Presbyterians that have a bicameral system and, and right. follow similar yeah. stuff. No, no, that's right. That's right, for sure. Yep, yep. Okay. Well, thank you, friends. Uh, I hope you found this uh, useful, and uh, we'll see you next week. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Say hi to Barbara. I hope she's feeling better. Okay, yeah. we'll do. Right. <laughs>